All right, it looks like it's 10 o'clock here. So good morning again, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining this fourth webinar in our Sears on Prescribed Fire. My name is Rebecca Ozeran, and I'll be the moderator today. Our focus with today's webinar is on resources for burning, and we have a couple of really great speakers prepared to share with you. Just so you're all clear on how this works, if you haven't been in one of our webinars before, you are all going to be muted and you will not have video access to share your own faces. So if you have any questions for us, please use either the chat box or the Q&A box. The chat box will be for questions like technical issues, and the Q&A box will be for any question that you want our presenters to answer at the end of the webinar today. We will be monitoring both the chat box and the Q&A box to make sure we get to all of your questions. Now, while the last few poll responses come in, I'd like to introduce our first presenter. First today is UC Cooperative Extension Area Fire Advisor, Lenya Quinn Davidson, who is based in Humboldt County. Lenya will be talking about prescribed burn associations today. So Lenya, whenever you are ready, please go ahead and start sharing your screen. And Max, I think we can close that poll. All right, Lenya, whenever you're ready, take it away. Okay, can you see that? Yes, looks great. Okay, great. Let me put it on full screen. Um, great. Well, thanks so much for um, for having me this morning. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about prescribed burn associations and share some of the great work that's going on um, all over California. Actually, I'm going to kind of talk quite a bit about our work in Humboldt County um, and then spread it out to talk a little more about what's going on in the rest of the state. And um, this picture that you're seeing right now is a photo. I was just out the other day monitoring some plots in one of our prescribed burns um, that we did with the PBA a couple years ago. And this was just one of the views from one of our beautiful um, burn units. Really nice loop in year this year. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge Jeff Stackhouse, who's my colleague with Extension. He's our livestock advisor in the Humboldt County office. And, um, my partner in most of the prescribed burn association work that, that we've been doing all over the state. So uh, the, the thing I want to start off with is just acknowledging what a uni unique time it is right now in California to be working on prescribed fire and in particular to be working with private landowners and communities. Um, I think we're seeing unprecedented interest and acknowledgement in the role of fire on the landscape and the value of prescribed fire as a tool for managing private land. Um, so, you know, our challenge, unlike 10 years ago, our challenge now really hasn't been to make a case for prescribed fire. It's been more to try to find opportunities for landowners and others to, to use fire and to engage with it. Um, the, the big problem, though, is we, you know, how can we bring prescribed fire back to private lands and really change the way that we view who's qualified to use fire. So I think a lot of us in California and in the West in general, you know, when we think of someone doing a prescribed burn, a prescribed burn we really picture something like what we're seeing on the screen here. Um, federal hotshot crew, Cal Fire crews, um, you know, we have this, this cultural feeling around prescribed fire that it should always be done by people who actually work in fire suppression and are fire professionals. And so um, we have a harder time visualizing something like this, where private landowners are out doing their own burning or working together to, you know, to bring prescribed fire to their lands as a land management tool, not just as a fire management tool. Um, so the challenge of bringing prescribed fire to private landscapes in California turns out to not just be a logistical challenge, but to also actually be a cultural challenge. And I think the prescribed burn association model has been helping us move the needle on that a little bit. So we in Humboldt County have been getting interest for a long time, um, several years from private landowners. You know, we're cooperative extension advisors, so we get a lot of landowners coming into our office and asking about various tools for land management, including prescribed fire, and um, really wondering how they could get more involved and have opportunities to use fire on their properties. So one thing that really piqued our interest was the prescribed burn associations in the Great Plains. And um, we had various connections to those 
mostly through um, the FIRE Learning Network, which is a national group that I'm pretty heavily involved with, um, with some of these prescribed burn associations out in the Great Plains. And we had seen some work by John Weir, who's kind of like the godfather of prescribed burn associations out of Oklahoma. He's also an extension um, specialist in Oklahoma, with the University of Oklahoma. Um, and he had published this survey in 2015 that looked at 27 different prescribed burn associations in the Great Plains. And um, they found that those 27 prescribed burn associations had conducted almost 1,100 burns covering more than 470,000 acres in just eight years. And they had basically no injuries, just one official report of injury with all of those different burns. Um, and an escape rate that was pretty similar to the federal escape rate, um, but no insurance claims or lawsuits. So this, this really was interesting to us in Humboldt County as we were trying to explore you know, opportunities for the landowners we were working with. And we decided to go out to the Great Plains, to Nebraska, and learn more about these burn associations, which are basically landowner and community cooperatives for prescribed fire. These are you know, normal people, normal landowners, a lot of ranchers and farmers who just get together and um, help each other conduct prescribed burns on each other's property. So we went out to Nebraska in March of 2017 and spent about a week burning with two different prescribed burn associations. And we were just blown away by how effective they were, how safe they were, and how different they looked from the type of burning that we are used to in the West. Um, you know, these are, these are community members and landowners showing up with their, their old engines, their, um, their ATVs, their garden tools and getting these burns done at a really impressive scale. So um, we decided we came back that spring and realized that there was just no reason why we couldn't do this in Humboldt County and in California. And um, so that spring in June of 2017, we did our first burn on a ranch um, with, with one of the ranchers that we work with here and um, staffed it entirely with community members and volunteer fire departments and other neighboring landowners. And it was a huge success. And so we did a couple more burns um, that year, that fall, we did a couple more. And in March of 2018, we officially formed the Humboldt County Prescribed Burn Association, which at that time was the first prescribed burn association in the West. Um, there, you know, no one had actually even really heard of a prescribed burn association at that time. And when we introduced the idea um, saying that it was coming from Nebraska, I think a lot of people were very dubious, you know, that California could replicate something from the Great Plains. But we found actually that it could be hugely successful here and that we could adapt it to make a lot of sense um, for California's landscape and for the communities that we work with. Um, so the Humboldt County Prescribed Burn Association has a board of directors, we have bylaws, we are a member organization, so we have people, um, people pay dues to be a member, it's $25 a year, and we have about a 300 person mailing list of folks who want to stay in the loop and, um, you know, just hear about all of our efforts. And, it's really based on the idea of neighbors helping neighbors. So instead of um, kind of the, the model that a lot of us are used to in California, where an agency like Cal Fire will come in and do the burn for the landowner, this model is really about the landowner taking the lead, working with other landowners and other community members to get the burning done. So it's really, it's really novel for California at this, you know, at this point in time. Um, there is a history in California which I'll talk about a little later, of people doing exactly this kind of burning, and of course of Native American burning for millennia. So it's not like the concept of, of average people using fire is a new one, but in this present day, it is kind of a, um, a novel way to think about prescribed fire. So it's pretty exciting. Our prescribed burn association has really diverse membership. Humboldt County, you know, we have back to the lander hippies, we have timber companies, we have um, conservative ranchers, we have all different kinds of people. And it's been really fun to see that the Prescribed Burn Association is able to bring all those folks together and have some shared values and some shared work. So we've 
we've really seen that the PBA has pulled in people from all different parts of the community. We also work really closely with volunteer fire departments and we've been able to engage them really well, not only to provide them training, but also for them to help provide the resources like engines and, and crews that we need to get the burns done. So that's been kind of a, um, a really special part of, of our prescribed burn association in Humboldt County has been the interaction with the volunteer fire departments. Um, I think over the last couple of years, we've worked with about 13 different rural volunteer fire departments just right here in Humboldt County. Um, we also have great CAL FIRE support, and we're in a unit where we have a, a really wonderful working relationship with, with CAL FIRE, and they've been hugely supportive of this prescribed burn association effort, even though it was pushing their comfort zone for sure. You know, when we first started this work, it was so unusual um, that it was a little bit of a it, you know, it took some time to build that comfort, but they're they're hugely supportive and realize that we're actually partners with them on being able to increase the scale of prescribed fire on private lands. We do bring in private contractors sometimes. So if we have, um, you know, complex burns that are during fire season, we'll we'll often hire a private burn boss to come in and lead the burn, and that's been a really effective um, strategy for us. And we have a couple private burn bosses who we really enjoy working with. So that's, that's been great. And then because we're University of California Cooperative Extension, we're also able to build in a research program around all these burns, um, education program, and do a lot of outreach on the value of prescribed fire. So, you know, lots of field tours and radio shows and things like that to highlight the value of this work. We also have a burn trailer and we've had great support from California Deer Association for purchasing a bunch of equipment and tools that we can use to implement these burns. So at this point, we have a pretty robust cache of equipment. And this is, this is actually a really common um, thing that the PBAs do, like in the Great Plains, we actually got the idea from the Great Plains again, because they were getting support from um, groups like the National Wild Turkey Federation and Ducks Unlimited and Pheasants Forever um, to build these these burn trailers and then the, the tools and equipment are available to any of the prescribed burn association members who need to use them um, so you can just hook up the trailer you know bring it out to your property and you have everything there that you need so we have um we probably have 50 hand tools we have 15 drip torches and then we have these great slip-in units that you can see in the pictures here that you can put in the back of any truck and they have a water tank and a pump and it's all one unit. And those have been really, um, really wonderful. We also were able to get 42 VHF radios and we bought our own countywide radio frequency. So that gives us, um, you know, really good communication on our burns and um, a, a lot of flexibility and so we're not borrowing a radio frequency from CAL FIRE or from other fire departments. So in Humboldt County, we've been able to, to implement 24 burns for about 1,200 acres since that first burn when we came back from Nebraska. So there's just been a ton of momentum and lots of interest from landowners, from community members. And um, yeah, we just, it's been hugely successful. And it, it's, it's neat because this year-round local capacity that the PBA gives us has allowed us to take advantage of a lot of different burn windows and meet a really diverse array of burn objectives. So I'm just going to walk you through some of the things that we've, um, that we've focused on in our burning. So we do some invasive species control um, in our rangelands for late phenol weeds like medusa head. Um, there's interest in star thistle burning. We have, we just recently discovered um, barbed oak grass in Humboldt County, which these are all late season invasives that can be treated really effectively with prescribed fire. Um, so we've done a lot of burning from Medusa head. That's kind of the main one that, that we've dealt with here. And we have to target that the right time of year, late spring, early summer, and um, really effective burning. We also do a lot for conifer encroachment in oak woodlands. So we have a, a pretty huge problem with dug fir growing up under our deciduous oaks and overtopping them and eventually killing them. And we're losing our oak woodlands at a massive scale here in the North Coast and ac across the Pacific Northwest. So prescribed fire has been 
you know, hugely important for bringing that, that disturbance regime back in and protecting those oaks. These are just more pictures of our winter burning in oak woodlands. Um, we also do a lot of burning for coyote brush in coastal grasslands. And so here you can see three pictures of the same burn unit. That bottom picture I actually just took the other day again, and you can see the lupin blooms that have come in. Um, at, you know, we, they were kind of under that all that coyote brush, and the coyote brush has been killed, and those lupin seeds were released, and it's just gorgeous out there right now. But we've been doing quite a few. Some of our bigger burns are these coyote brush burns out in these um, coastal prairies and grasslands. We have also done some understory fuels reduction burns, which you know there's a there's a lot of the of interest in this kind of thing down in the southern part of our county, um, and we'd we'd like to do more. The the burns we've done in um, forest ecosystems have been pretty small so far, just five around five acres. We've done a few of those, um, and then we've done a bunch of other random. Project. So we've done some little research burns. We've burned blackberry. Um, we did a really interesting burn in a vineyard to get rid of grasshopper habitat um, because the grasshoppers were really affecting the grapes. So um, you can see just even in one county how versatile prescribed fire can be. And the day of burn costs with the Prescribed Burn Association are very low. This is one of the benefits of it. Um, you know, it's mostly volunteer based. It's people helping each other out. And that brings the cost down to sometimes down to zero, um, if you can believe it. And the, the landowners in our Prescribed Burn Association, the landowner is expected to provide lunch for the crews and, you know, fuel for the drip torches and things like that. But um, really, there there's not a lot of cost. And that's so just one of the beautiful things about this model. Um, prime, you know, the primary costs really are in the unit preparation. It's especially if you're in a forest setting where you're having to do, you know, pre any kind of pre-treatment. But we've found that um, we can really offset those costs with the NRCS, Fish and Wildlife Service, and other cost share programs. That's been a great thing for landowners to access if they do anticipate having significant, um, you know, unit preparation costs. Now, at this point, you're all probably wondering about liability and how that works. That's one of the big questions we get from folks. Um, I like to think about it as kind of three main aspects to liability on these burns. You know, the one that people think of the most is damages from an escape. So what happens if the fire escapes control, burns down the neighbor's stand of timber or, you know, a barn or something like that? And for our PBA burns, um, we have a, a clear acknowledgement that that liability is on the landowner. Um, now the landowner, when we hire that private burn boss, you know, if we hire that private burn boss, then they can have an agreement where they're sharing that liability. The burn boss usually comes with some kind of insurance policy. Um, sometimes the landowner has property insurance that covers prescribed fire as a practice. Um, but we're very clear with the PBA that the landowner is assuming the liability for any kind of damage from an escape. Um, that sa the same would be true for suppression costs associated with an escape. So, you know, you could have a, a fire burn onto a neighbor's property, not cause any problems, but, um, that, but trigger a CAL FIRE response where they would come in and suppress it. And that, come, that could come at a cost. Um, so again, that's that the landowner knows that, that that's really their, their responsibility. Um, and we haven't had a problem with that. I think most landowners kind of understand that the activities that take place on their properties are their responsibility. And we've never had anything close to an escape or we've never had suppression costs. Nothing like that's ever happened on any of our burns. But, um, but that is the way that works. The other thing that I think is probably the most realistic liability for us in doing these burns is having an injury to one of the volunteers. And so we do have a waiver form that um, a lawyer helped us develop, and we have everyone fill that out before every burn. And that's just to cover the landowners so that they don't have an issue if someone gets, um, gets injured. Now, there are some interesting developments at the state level. Um, there is a, a SB 1260, Senate Bill 1260, a couple years ago um, mandated the development of a state certified burn boss program in California, which is a huge deal. And um, 
that's been in development over the last year or so and will be finalized this summer and rolling out next January. And that is going to give us new opportunities for liability sharing with CAL FIRE and for suppression support from CAL FIRE for certified burn bosses. So um, feel free to reach out to me if you're interested in that. Um, I think that it's really going to give us more opportunity. It's a pretty exciting program. So the core philosophies of our Humboldt County PBA model, um, one of the big ones is that everyone's welcome and has something to contribute. And this goes back to that idea that, um, you know, fire users don't have to be fire professionals. This is a community effort and that we can, we can find a way to engage anyone who's interested in, in participating in this. So we have people who make the lunch, who take pictures, who take weather. Then we have the people who are carrying the drip torches. It's really a community effort. And so we, we try not to be exclusive at all. Um, every burn is a training burn. And I don't know if, if you all are familiar with the prescribed fire training exchange model, um, the TREX model, but that's a lot of my prescribed fire experience and passion came out of doing TREX events. And so these PBA burns are really modeled kind of like a TREX burn where there's a focus on learning and sharing and um, and really, you know, just improving over time. So we we try to really infuse our our PBA burns with that philosophy of every burn is a training burn. And then prescribed fire doesn't have to be expensive or, or overly bureaucratic. I think this is a huge one. Um, these PBAs are really about bringing prescribed fire back to the ground level, back to the community level, and not having it be super expensive, not having there be um, you know, we don't need huge grants to do this work. We really just need to help each other out. And I think that's been one of the really surprising things about our success in Humboldt County is just how inexpensive and how simple it can be to pull these burns together um, if you have the right people involved. And we're really bringing fire back as a land management tool, not just a fire management tool. And, um, and you know, really bringing it back to land managers. So that's what makes it so exciting. Now, the success in Humboldt County has sparked a lot of interest and a lot of momentum all over California, and especially in Northern California. So you see on this map, which Jeff put together, um, people, like different counties are in different stages of development for prescribed burn associations or similar groups. And um, we're just seeing a, a growth and development around this, this community-based prescribed fire model that is unprecedented. And in the last two years, the face of prescribed fire on private lands in California has just completely shifted. And I think in large part because of that inspiration that we brought back from the Great Plains. So it's a neat, a neat connection there and kind of an unexpected one. So I'm just gonna talk about a, a few of the different groups. Um, so there are a lot, a lot of the groups are calling themselves different things, but um, in, in many counties, they are prescribed burn associations, just like the Humboldt County one. Um, so the Mendocino PBA, there's the Butte PBA, the Siskiyou PBA is just getting off the ground. And then there's interest in all these other counties as well. So, um, and I, I know I'm missing some there. I just threw this, to, this slide together this morning, but a um, lot of interest in forming PBAs, uh, usually at the county level. Then there's also, um, there are groups that don't call themselves a prescribed burn association, but they really operate like a prescribed burn association and were inspired by the same, you know, by the model, basically. So the Good Fire Alliance is down in Sonoma County, and they're coordinated by Audubon Canyon Ranch, um, ACR, in the North Bay. And they have a fire engine, they have fire staff, they're able to pull together burns and very similar to a prescribed burn association. I think because of where they're located um, and because of the, the types of engagement they're getting, they have a lot of members who are from the nonprofit community. So a lot of you know, folks who aren't necessarily landowners but are really interested in natural resource management and um, th their membership probably looks a little different than the Humboldt County PBA. They also have a formal memorandum of agreement in place between all these various um, organizations who are working together on that group. So 
Yeah, it's a good fire alliance. Um, there are also groups called range improvement associations, and these are actually the groups that were formed by ranchers back in the 1940s and 1950s and kind of went dormant for a while, um, but are now having this resurgence. And these are led by the ranching community and really have a focus on range improvement. So Santa Barbara County and San Luis Obispo County both have those and they're getting, getting going again. And really they are very similar to a prescribed burn association. Plumas County has the Plumas Underburn Cooperative, which again is just another name for a PBA. Um, they're, they're pretty similar in some ways to the Humboldt County PBA. They're coordinated by the Resource Conservation District and the Fire Safe Council, a lot of forested burn units. And they really started small with um, pile burning workshops and kind of like small scale efforts. And just earlier this year moved into doing some broadcast units. So you can see some pictures there from some burns they did in February. Then uh, one of the newest groups is the Sierra Sequoia Burn Cooperative. And this is a group in the Southern Sierra Nevada and um, probably maybe close to where some of you are. And they are really unique because they have a focus on cultural burning and tribal engagement. So it's exciting because they, they really are kind of a prescribed burn association, but with this unique emphasis. So I'm excited to work with them. And we're trying to spearhead some ways for all these different groups to network and share. So, you know, none of us are having to recreate the wheel. And so we can really accelerate the efforts by all these groups. So we have a, um, there's a, a platform called Podio that's like a networking space. And we have a, um, a networking page for all these different California PBAs that we're trying to help store documents and share ideas and, and just stay in close communication. We also have a new website, so you all could check this out. It's calpba.org, and this has information about prescribed burn associations. Um, it has information on all the different PBAs that are you know, located around the state, and information on how to start a PBA, if that's something you're interested in. So I recommend checking out that website. And the last thing I wanted to bring up is, um, recently I was introduced to this idea of different forms of scaling our work. You know, in fire, we talk a lot about increasing the pace and scale. You hear that a lot, increase the pace and scale of prescribed fire. But what does that really mean? And so when I saw this, um, it, it really resonated with me and with the work that we're doing on prescribed burn associations, because there are different ways to think about how we're scaling. We can scale up and impact laws and policy. So, you know, we see, we see that with the burn boss program that's in development that we're, probably, we're really changing the way liability is looked at and the way that people are, are trained and qualified. And that's, that's great. That's that kind of scaling up that you see on the top. The scaling out is greater numbers, right? Replication and dissemination. I think of this as with the PBAs, we're really seeing the scaling out of just different groups popping up everywhere, more people getting involved, more pe you know, people hearing about these models through workshops like this. Um, then scaling deep, so impacting the cultural roots. And this really is relevant to the prescribed burn association movement because we're questioning um, the idea that, that landowners and that normal people can't have a relationship with fire. And we're saying, you know what, we can, and fire can be part of our private toolbox. We don't have to be fire suppression experts in order to engage with and use fire as a tool. And then if you get down into these, um, these lower two, they get a little deeper even. And um, the scree scaling, impacting norms and expectations. I really like this, legitimizing a multitude of different small and more relevant solutions. And I think that is like what we were just highlighting with the PBAs, right? Is that every local area is going to look a little different. The partnerships will be different. The model will be a little bit, a little bit different and adapted to the local um, setting and context, and that's how it'll be successful. That's how we're really going to scale this work up um, and and make a difference um, is by having this really local grassroots level solution. So, um, and then changing the access that people have to prescribed fire and to training and to knowledge and to networks. 
Um, so all five of these, I think, are just really relevant to prescribe burn associations and to the work that we're doing. And um, with that, I think I will I will end and um, yeah, appreciate have, having me on here today. We'll stop my share. All right, thank you so much, Lenya. That was fantastic. I hope everybody has got some good thoughts. And just as a reminder, if you have any questions for Lenya, please put them in the Q&A box and we'll be sure to get back to them after our next presentation. Our second speaker today is a district conservationist with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, Robin Smith, who's based in Mariposa. Robin will be talking about our NRCS programs and funding resources for prescribed fire. So whenever you are ready, Robin, please feel free to start sharing your screen and I will hand over to you whenever you are ready. Looks great. Can't hear you right now. I think you may be muted still. Wait. Perfect. I hear you now. Okay, great. Super. Um, thanks so much. Uh, Lenya, that was an amazing presentation and, and I feel like I learned an awful lot and uh, I feel like we have a connection with some um, fabulous opportunities and tools, and I'm certain that folks from Mariposa area will be contacting you, and I know that they probably already have been. Um, first of all, you know, in Mariposa area, we are definitely looking at um, doing prescribed fire, um, both from the rangeland perspectives and forest land perspectives, um, and, and expanding our use of it. And so um, I'm pretty excited to be involved in this today. And um, I'd just like to share some general ideas and opportunities uh, relating to prescribed fire from the NRCS perspective. Um, as most of you know, uh, um, we used to be the Soil Conservation Service and we were created in 1935 in, in response to the Dust Bowl crisis. Uh, the biggest thing about us is that we're non-regulatory. So we're able to work with private landowners um, in a non-threatening way and um, that opens up a lot of doors for us, I believe, and, and for our customers. Uh, we, we work a lot in um, natural resource planning. We can provide technical assistance. Uh, we can provide financial assistance for certain um, things. And um, we are very, very much focused on uh, sustaining our natural resources and enhancing them. And by that, you know, I, it's a focus on soil, water, air, plants, animals, humans, and energy. And um, so the things that we can work on are, are very diverse, which uh, um, is, is a wonderful thing, honestly. And, and we've had the opportunity to work on so many different things with private landowners, um, not only throughout California, but throughout the United States. Um, when we talk about technical assistance or, or even financial assistance, we have a lot of resource specialists that we work with from soil conservationists and folks that help private landowners with their conservation planning on the ground to soil scientists, um, biologists, rangeland specialists, foresters, and, and you can see the list here, engineers. Uh, we have folks that, that focus on agronomy and plant materials. And relating to this, we're, we're working a lot currently on ramping up our skills and our specialists relating to prescribed fire because we consider this very, very important. When a landowner, it's important for um, folks to know that, that we don't go knocking on doors with landowners and, and saying, hi, we're here to help. But we do put out announcements when we have programs coming up or we get a lot of referrals from other private landowners. So when we have successful projects on one person's land, then their neighbor says, oh, how did you do that? Or, or they share with their neighbors, you know, you should contact NRCS. And so we have a lot of 
um, referrals from folks and a lot of people that come in our door requesting our assistance. And when that person asks for our assistance, we can uh, begin our efforts with them to get them eligible for our programs, to conduct field visits and, with appropriate specialists, and develop conservation plans to meet their goals. Um, and so in doing that, we'll, we'll go out to the site with the landowner, we'll look at their resources, um, we'll talk about what they're concerned about, and we'll offer ideas or thoughts or observations when we're out there, and we'll analyze the situation and look at the, the health of the forest, rangeland, cropland, or, or whatever it is that um, we're doing with this landowner, and um, identify any problems together that, that we observe and that they observe, and then we'll talk about options and it, uh, alternatives and things that we can do to assist them with enhancing those soil, water, air, plant, animal, human, and energy resources. And in doing so, we utilize farm bill programs um, very extensively, and, and there are many farm bill programs. Um, in particular, I, I'm going to speak most about environmental quality incentives program, um, because there are so many options under this program that uh, can address a myriad of resource concerns. And, and through the Farm Bill and through EQIP, we provide technical assistance or financial assistance um, to, to work on those things that um, have been identified as priorities, like improving water and air quality, conserving ground and surface water, uh, reducing soil erosion, of course, uh, enhancing and improving wildlife habitat, and reducing the risk of wildfires and in improving the productivity of the rangeland, forest, rent land, or croplands, and um, reducing non native invasive plant uh, populations. And, and so it's an important thing for us that we try to address as many of these issues as we can at one time. And when a person is working with us, uh, it's not going to be that we're usually just going to go to, to do one of these things. Um, it, it will be something where we're trying to get a holistic approach to address as many issues as possible. Um, in particular, in Mariposa, I'm most familiar with forest land and rangeland applications. We do have a little cropland. Um, we're not in an area that's considered non-attainment, so air quality um, is not something that that scores high for us in, in um, applications for things, but it is definitely something we always consider and would be very much considering with prescribed burning. And then we weave in always fish and wildlife habitat into everything that we do. I'm mentioning rangeland practices in particular. Uh, we did have a rangeland burn association years ago, as many of you know and um, we're revitalizing that and, and uh, a lot of people in Mariposa County are working together. As you saw on Lenya's map, little Mariposa County in the, in the center of California, um, the, the interest and effort is growing in um, returning prescribed burning um, as a tool for, for many of our uses. We recognize that uh, prescribed burning, it would be extremely valuable in promoting our rangeland health and enhancing the eco ecological functions, and also um, enhancing wildlife habitat values for our area. It's something that we need. Um, in addition to that, we're, we're very much focused on forestry practices. Uh, over the last few years, Mariposa County was considered the epicenter of the tree mortality issue, and um, we've been dealing uh, with large volumes of forestry um, projects where we're trying to help reduce the fire hazards, um, clean up some of the mess, and restore healthy forest functions. And um, so we consider prescribed burning a valuable tool that we're looking forward to being able to use with some of our private landowners to help restore these um, values. So some of the things that, that we've been concerned about are things that you're all familiar with, and that's just wildfire hazard from biomass accumulation. And we've really seen this, especially in the forestry projects um, with the tree mortality issue here. Uh, we have areas where 100% of our stands of conifers have been wiped out 
and then we have areas where we have a mixture of conifers and, and oak um, in the that transition zone and our oaks are suffering as well and so we have a huge amount of biomass accumulation. Uh, we have the situation as most of you have where people have loved their trees and bushes so much that we have just heavy concentrations where the land should be opened up a whole lot more and so all of these plants are obviously competing for so what for the nutrients and the water and the sunlight that they need and as a result we have undesirable plant productivity and health and our structure and composition of our stands is not what it should be and um, disruption in our systems has caused soil erosion and the soil erosion um, degrades water quality and um, we have a we have an issue here that things are out of whack and we feel the need to restore healthy functioning. So I've lumped together some of the practices here that we work on quite frequently with landowners and I've just used um, general terms but a lot of what we've done has been mastication on private lands, uh, hand treatment, dozer work, tree pruning slash disposal, and follow-up treatment of resprouting brush. So over the last several years, here in Mariposa County, um, NRCS has worked with private landowners to implement like over 400 contracts uh, to do this sort of work. And um, we've invested over $20 million in this area. And so it's a huge program for us. And we have a lot of people that are contacting us because they need these types of practices on their land. Uh, the things that NRCS um, frequently participates in and provides uh, resources for are things like constructing fire breaks and, and um, fuel breaks and helping with the financing of a prescribed burn plan and doing site preparation and getting ready for a burn. Uh, as, as we'll go into a little further, it, our process is not fast but we can bring some financial resources as well as technical resources to the table to help landowners and to work together with the partnerships to achieve greater goals on the landscape. So with NRCS, the landowner, um, they make the decision that they want to do it. Everything with us, as I mentioned before, we're non-regulatory. Everything that the landowner does is voluntary. Um, and there are some things that we've put on their shoulders uh, to get a burn done and that's that they will provide the burn plan and um, as I'm sure that you are all aware there are many ways of doing that uh, and you can see here examples CAL FIRE National Wildfire Coordination Group and um, technical service providers with NRCS and so we we have the landowner tasked with with pulling this together and then also obtaining their permits that are needed for actually conducting a burn. And in everything that we do, whether it's a forestry project, a rangeland project, or a cropland project, anything that we do, we always have to take into consideration wildlife habitat and water quality, um, threatened and endangered species and cultural resources. So there are certain things that we will be doing with the landowner to make sure that we're not damaging any resources. We'll be doing cultural resource surveys to make sure that we're not damaging any sites or um, we'll be working within windows of opportunities that are appropriate for working with certain species of wildlife. So the biggest thing for us in working with a private landowner is that they either lease the land or own the land, but they, they have control of the land. And so property size is not a limitation for us. We've worked from a single acre to thousands of acres uh, with our landowners. <coughs> The other thing is for eligibility purposes, that um, participant cannot make more than $900,000 a year. And so most of us meet that requirement in the situation where we're working with entities, maybe larger groups, um, that would be a, a requirement to make sure that their individual members do not make over that, or um, payments might be reduced uh, associated with um, that membership. We usually have three batching periods per year, and that just means those are 
those are times when we actually try to get our applications funded. Um, sometimes we have more, sometimes we have less. Uh, this year we're having delays, we have had delays relating to um, the final rollout of the farm bill and then we've been retooling uh, our, our computer systems and, and the programs that we use to help the landowners with their conservation planning and to get them ready for funding and to be able to do the work. So we did have a funding round here May 8th and um, as an example in Mariposa County I, I think we funded around 60 applications and um, the truth is we, we have a big backlog here and I can't speak for all of the other offices but in many cases there's, there's a high workload and limited staff and um, these things take a long time for us to get through the system. And so it's important for you not to think as a private landowner that you're going to come into our office this week and we're going to be burning on your um, land this next fall. It's highly unlikely. Um, it takes us time, um, but it's well worth it. So uh, anybody who is interested in our program should begin their application with their local office now um, and, and start the process and then go from there because some offices may be able to react more quickly than we are, um, but it, it still takes a while. So many of you are familiar with NRCS and you can go to our state website and um, we break it down into this five steps for assistance and you'll see that on our website. But we start with working with you to plan what it is that you want. And so you come into our office, we begin the discussion, we figure out what specialists are needed, and we, we try to get assistance out to you. Um, and, and then you do an application with us and we get you eligible with the Farm Service Agency. Um, and then uh, when we have a plan developed with you, we put all of these applications together and we rank them, they, they get numeric scores based on answers to questions relating to the resource concerns and what it is we're uh, planning to do on your property and priorities. And so then um, when we get those projects funded, and honestly, in the last three years, we've gotten probably 98% of our um, applications funded in Mariposa County. So I, can't, I cannot speak for other offices, but um, there's a chance that somebody gets funded um, fairly quickly, but then there's a chance that they remain in the, in the pot to be funded in future funding rounds and the like. And so then when we get the project funded and we get all of the contracting together and we make sure that the cultural resources are cleared and we're not having any detrimental impacts to the wildlife and the like, then we are able to implement the programs. And um, although this upfront process takes an awful long time, the good news is, is when we get to this implementation part, when we inspect a project and it's done, uh, the payment part goes very, very quickly. So here is a, a map of the NRCS office locations. You can find that as well on the NRCS California website. And there's an email at or a website um, URL there. So please feel free to look up your local office. Um, I'm also available for information. Uh, I, I want to say thank you to Jenny Johnson uh, for uh, providing this initial um, PowerPoint presentation. But in addition to that, um, you can see on this screen that there's me speaking on the left hand side. And that's how you may contact me. And I'm happy to talk with any of you about our programs or help you make contacts. And then on, excuse me, that was the left-hand side. On the right-hand side is Fletch Nelson. Now Fletch is also in the audience and um, Fletch is our area range conservationist. And he has a lot of knowledge relating to range applications, uh, especially uh, relating to prescribed fire. Uh, we have uh, several folks in California who are working on prescribed fire and we would bring folks down here to help us plan something with you and um, we, we, we just have many resources uh, but it is a slow process as I mentioned already and um, I know that Fletch would welcome any questions um, and I would welcome any questions and we're here to help. 
and that's it for us. Thank you so much, Robin. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, everybody, it looks like we have a few questions in the Q&A. So if our speakers are going to be prepared to answer, um, I'll start with a question that came in for Lenya asking, is a PBA a 501c3? Yeah, you know, it just totally depends on um, on the PBA. So some like the Good Fire Alliance, um, it, I believe they do have 501c3 status. I might be wrong about that, but um, the Humboldt County PBA does not yet. We're talking about moving in that direction. But um, so we see everything from kind of just a loose collective of folks, um, you know, organized really loosely to all the way to the 501c3 model where they're getting grants on their own and, um, and you know, it's more formal, so. Great, thank you. Our next question is a little longer and I might aim it at both of you, but maybe Robin can tackle this first. Uh, this comes from a private landowner in Napa County, has 10 acres of undeveloped land considered fire zone three, and they're confused about where to start if they wanna do small chunks at a time. The overall plan is to reduce their fuel load and get rid of invasive species like French broom and improve habitat for wildlife. There also may be an issue with sudden oak death. So what are the impacts of fire on all of those things and how would this person start thinking about prescribed fire? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I would recommend, first of all, contacting your local NRCS office and certainly working with UC and starting to analyze these things. Um, 10 acres is not too small for us. Uh, and I would recommend that you have experts in your area that are familiar with your particular topics like said no death um, to, to work with you on these um, issues and, and just start the process and uh, feel free to contact me if you like and I will get you the specific contact um, for NRCS there. Uh, also, it, it's always good to um, strengthen your relationships with CAL FIRE and, and other entities in your area that are working on this same issue. Thanks, Robin. Lania, did you have any other thoughts about that? No, I mean, I think what Robin said is right. I think it, it would help to get someone out there to look at it. Um, you know, and if you're thinking of actually wanting to use prescribed fire, you should get involved. There's a there's a budding prescribed burn association in Lake County. And um, I think Mike Jones, our forest advisor with University of California Cooperative Extension out of um, the Ukiah office, he would be the best contact for that, I think. So um, reach out to him, maybe get him out there to look at it. You know, prescribed fires probably not gonna be your best tool for dealing with French broom, um, unless you're willing to, to commit to burning it every year. <laughs> um, the prescribed fire can really open up the seed bed on that stuff. And you might wanna look at some other options for managing something like that. But yeah, I'd say reach out to UC and to NRCS first and get someone out there. Perfect, thank you. All right, we have a question for you, Lenya. What kind of tribal involvement has there been in the prescribed fire associations that you know? Yeah, that's a great question and a question that we actually get a lot. Um, I think, again, it really just depends on the place. I, I talked about that Sierra Sequoia Burn Cooperative um, that group has a, a really heavy focus on, on tribal involvement. And I see that Jared Aldern is on, on the webinar today. That's great. So he'd be a great person to reach out to and, and see what that looks like. Here in Humboldt County, um, we work, I, I work pretty closely with the tribes in the, in the mid Klamath um, on treks related stuff. And um, we, we certainly are in communication with each other about each other's efforts but they haven't the tribes out there haven't been super involved in the humboldt county prescribed burn association yet um we i mean we'd welcome that and we've we, the pba could go out and burn in that area it's a couple hours from where i'm based our county is so big that we tend to stick a little more to central and southern humboldt county for the pba work but um the tribes in humboldt county have really robust prescribed fire programs and so 
um, they haven't, I don't, I, you know, I don't know that they've needed us really to get done what they need to do. In January, we hosted a, um, a meeting of all these different PBA leaders from across the state. And we did have someone from the Karuk tribe join us there um, because they're trying to lead up more family-based burning is what they're calling it. And they've done a bunch this winter. And that really is similar to the prescribed burn association model. This, I, this you know, it's more kind of casual, small scale um, family based burning. So it was really nice to have the Kruk tribe represented to talk about that. Um, yeah, so it just really depends on the local place and who's involved and, and who lives in the community and who shows up. Great, thanks, Lenya. On a related note, Robin, we have a question of whether reservations, rancherias and allotment lands are qualified for NRCS programs. Oh, absolutely. We have special programs for our tribal um, participants and we can uh, fund projects either under our tribal fund pools or um, under our regular equip fund pools. But we're happy, very happy to work with our tribal folks. And it, and it can be federally recognized or non-recognized. Um, so we're, we're looking forward to that. Great, thank you. Uh, this is another question about tribal resources. Um, so I'll open it up to both of you. What protections typically are there in the PBA process to safeguard tribal cultural resources or other archeological resources? Well, I mean, again, I think, um, I think in the PBA context, prescribed burn associations are really local grassroots cooperatives for getting prescribed fires done, right? So they're, and it's, it's primarily and almost always on private land. So um, depending on the project, there may be, um, you know, CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, or NEPA, um, the National Environmental Protection Act may come into play. Um, certainly if you're getting NRCS funding, you know, if a landowner is getting NRCS funding or CAL FIRE funding or any kind of state or federal funding to implement a prescribed burn, um, no matter if they're doing it with a PBA or in some other fashion, they're going to have to, you know, to do archaeological surveys and, and go through that environmental compliance process to, to safeguard those, those resources. Um, if you're just a landowner who's using prescribed fire on your property with no outside funding and it's, you know, it's a, it's more just kind of local thing that you're doing on your property like anything else you'd be doing on your property, um, you're not necessarily going to have some kind of formal process for doing archaeological surveys or something like that. So for the P, from the PBA standpoint, the PBA is really about bringing the community together to implement the burns. It's not, um, there's not an environmental compliance process that's built into the PBA model. Okay, so this is Robin and, you know, we're very careful to try not to do any damage to any resources. And we do do, as mentioned by Lenya, we do do um, an environmental analysis on each and every project that we do. We do do cultural resource surveys and we submit reports to the State Historic Preservation Office and get approvals to move forward. Um, it doesn't mean that if a site is discovered on a property that the entire project ceases. It doesn't mean that at all. It, it means that we do everything that we can to protect that site. And so we might restrict access to a certain location or something like that. Um, but then in, in doing this whole analysis, there is supposed to be consultation with the local tribe that occurs um, with our cultural resource folks. So we, we just make every attempt possible to make sure that we're not doing any damage to any resources. Great, thank you both for those answers. We have a couple more questions about EQIP. Um, unfortunately, one person says that their county tells them that there is a six year waiting list for their EQIP grant review. Is there anything else they can do? Oh my. Um, each office, there are so many offices throughout the state and they have varying workloads and they have varying staffing and varying expertise um, amongst their staff. And so, Unfortunately, I don't really have any control over any other office and nobody has any control over how we run our office. 
um, I would just work with them, just keep working with them. And I know this sounds weird, but be the squeaky wheel. You know, let them know how important this is to you. Let them know all of the resource values that are at risk and continue to work with them and try to, to um, get their support for it being a high priority project and um, don't give up on them. And I would get in line and stay in line if possible and just, again, be the squeaky wheel, keep contacting them. And um, beyond that, I mean, you can contact your area staff and, and move up through the state, but uh, I think it's best to have a good relationship with your local people that you're working with and trying to uh, bring them up to speed on what it is you're trying to do and how important it is. Great, thank you. All right, one last question that I see right now uh, for Robin again. Do you have resources to help landowners determine as they're looking into EQIP how much they might end up paying for a project? Yes and no. Um, the, the way our programs work is that our contract ends up being with the landowner and we pay set prices for set items or we call them contract items or practices that we're implementing on that land. And so we pay a certain amount. And um, in some areas with some contractors, some contractors agree to do the work within the amount we allocate. Um, but our, our program is actually intended to be a cost share type program where we pay the set amount and then the landowner covers any additional costs. Uh, and, and so that ends up being a regional issue or a case by case um, issue where uh, we can we can tell you what we pay. Um, we may or may not have information relating to how much things like that are running in our area, um, but uh, it's it's the responsibility falls heavily on the landowner to do their research and figure out their costs and figure out if they're going to be able to do it or not, um, because it is intended to be an incentives program where we're trying to help out, but not necessarily cover 100% of the cost. All right, great. Unless there are any other questions, it looks like we are wrapping up a little early today. Um, so we'll give it a couple more minutes to see, but in the meantime, I wanna thank both of our speakers very much again, Lenya and Robin, thank you so much for sharing your expertise on this. We got some really great questions and I think you provided some really valuable information and hopefully you will see some follow-up afterward. Uh, for our attendees who are still listening in, when this webinar ends, you will be taken to a survey and we would really appreciate your feedback so that we can continue to improve this series. And this survey specifically has a question about whether you want to be contacted with information about PBAs near you. So please do fill out that survey if you are interested. It looks like our poll has a pretty high interest rate in PBAs, so that should be exciting for everybody. And don't forget that at the same time next Wednesday, 10 a.m., We'll have the final webinar in this series with a focus on cultural burning and the next steps of how to get burning done. So we hope to have everybody join us again. And I still don't see any other Q&A. So in the meantime, stay safe out there and we hope everybody has a great week. Thank you all.